All right, all right. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, welcome to the Ujama Hour. My name is Michael Tekken Strode. Uh, I am the uh, coordinator here of the Cool Donut Collaborative, uh, Chicago's only time based service and skills exchange, otherwise known as the Time Bank, as well as uh, a member um, of the uh, Cooperation, Collaboration, Study, and Working Group, uh, which is a space which grounds itself in the Black cultural history of cooperative economic strategies and development, techniques, tools, um, in order that we can build in contemporary times uh, cooperatives that can meet our social, cultural, and economic needs. Um, so we, we uh, you know, look forward to engaging with folks uh, around cooperatives. We look forward to digging into that history. And I've been so delighted lately to see uh, some of the ways that even the things that we have been talking about over the past two years in the cooperation, collaboration, study, and working group are popping up in the mainstream, right? Um, so recently I shared on a couple of the different spaces, um, the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network uh, Facebook and group pages, the Colonel Collaborative page, um, and, 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 you know, just various spaces on social media, um, that Bloomberg City Lab posted a visual history of mutual aid. And a lot of what folks are, 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 are excavating and mining in terms of locating that visual history of mutual aid um, really are rooted in um, some of the things that, that we, we began talking about within cooperation, collaboration, um, at, you know, around, as many groups did around the time of Collective Courage's release, you know, just about the history of cooperatives within black communities um, that, you know, were started um, not necessarily to counter uh, a period of industrial revolution, but was started to uh, counter uh, marginalization and, and, and racism and, you know, and, and the sort of historical legacies of white supremacy and pathology and things like that. Um, so, you know, um, I, I, I am immediately skipping over, you know, uh, some of the intros for the day because I am very excited, you know, to be here on the broadcast today. Um, really looking forward to um, what we have in store today. This is a special edition interview uh, that really is grounded in digging into the principles that we are engaging today um, here on this first day of Kwanzaa. Um, and that principle that we're engaged in today is Umoja, uh, unity. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I'd started to do, um, you know, some years ago when I was just doing some, some informal blogging, um, just doing some of my own meditation and writing on um, some of the principles of Kwanzaa um, was really to, to, to start thinking about how it related to the work that I was doing at the time. So I have this, this uh, piece that I wrote, you know, back in 2013. Um, this was around the time that I, I would have been, you know, working uh, with the Healthy Food Hub, um, or at least in the depths of that work with the Healthy Food Hub. You know, that work ever continues. It has never, never stopped. Um, and I was trying to think about what is the relationship of this principle of unity, of this principle of emoja to the work that I was doing with the Healthy Food Hub at the time around community resilience. Um, and it's actually something that really leads to this broadcast, you know, in the, on the Ujima Hour, which, you know, I'll connect in just a moment. But I'll just read a piece of that, that writing um, that I did at the time. Um, that goes, while formless, ethereal, and conceptual discussions of unity have their place in shaping inner growth, uh, we should lose no great expense of energy to intractable debates which do not advance our outer work. Our shared circumstance requires a principled, intersectional, and action-oriented unity, the unity of companions who have made an agreement to walk in a particular direction and work out their grievances along the way. Besa Saka, the sack of cola nuts. The unity of those who understand agriculture, trade, commerce, and economic structure, these basic elements of building cohesive and resilient communities, not limited in, the, in their understanding of economics as a conversation about the negotiation of currency, but the allocation of resources. What human, natural, and, and mental resources exist at our disposal for responsible, and I'll use this next term you know, cautiously because ultimately I would use a different word nowadays. At the time, I said responsible exploitation. Um, you know, we throw exploitation out the window nowadays. How might the value and utility of those resources be amplified by uniting them with complementary resources whose shared effort strengthens the community? Let us not unite simply to say that we have done so, but to, do, but to more deeply understand the benefit of aligning our movement within the framework of a shared principle. And so that is where we are uh, around Umoja. Um, it is not unity for unity's sake. 
Um, it is not simply to say that we are striving to maintain unity and family, community, nation, race, but it is actually to think about what is the con what constitutes unity, what is the what are the the elements and the fabric, what actually creates uh, spaces where we can unify um, with one another, and what what actually uh, causes us to tear at that fabric of unity, what actually causes us to come apart um, from that principle of unity and that principle of umoja. Um, because ultimately, if we if we can't um, unpack that, if we can't answer that question, um, then we will not get to the principle if we can't understand the sort of elements that that uh, bring us to that place. Um, and so all of those things, you know, factor into the work that I'm doing uh, nowadays with Cold Nut Collaborative and with the uh, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group and with this broadcast, the Ujama Hour, uh, the Ujama Hour, which is... Um, a space uh, to explore an exploration of the black social and solidarity economy through intimate informal conversation. Um, it is a curious space. Um, it is a space where we can unlock our curiosity about what it means to uh, cultivate local economies, to cultivate uh, communal economies, um, and to answer the questions of, of what it would take to build economies that are grounded in care, that are grounded in solidarity, that are grounded in mutual support, um, and that are grounded in cooperation, um, where people feel like they have full participation and access in, in how that economy is built out. Uh, so that is what we are doing here today, um, and that is ultimately what we do here on a monthly basis when we have these interviews with folks uh, around the solidarity economy. And, um, you know, a point of note, we are certainly booking um, interviews for the next calendar year, so, you know, um, I've still got probably six slots for the following calendar year. So, you know, if there are folks that uh, you think that I should be speaking to about this concept of this uh, Black social and solidarity economy, um, then you should probably just refer them to me. You know, um, feel free to tell them to email me at connect at coldnutcollab.org. That's connect at K-O-L-A-N-U-T-C-O-L-L-A-B.org. Um, you can refer them to the Colonel Collaborative Instagram, Facebook page, you know, any of those routes. I'm happy to, you know, um, to to drop in um, and have a conversation with those folks about uh, an interview for the 2021 calendar year, uh, because ultimately we're building an archive. We're building an archive of these conversations. Um, we're building an archive of the relationships that people are developing throughout this uh, within the social solidarity economy space. Um, and we we are building an understanding, again, of what, you know, um, what this uh, this this approach to uh, cooperative uh, economic development, um, this, this approach to social ec social economies looks like um, through a black cultural lens um, and through black organizing. You know, what are the what are the, the unique uh, ways that um, black organizers are informing um, or black organizers and academics and activists are informing the work of economic development that does not recreate and reproduce. Um, all of the, the, the systems that have um, exploited and marginalized, you know, um, our communities um, throughout, you know, decades and centuries. So that is what we are doing here. And that is why we have to have unity. But that is also why we have to understand how we get to unity. Uh, and, you know, so I, I am really looking forward to, um, you know, what we have in store for today. Um, and we're going to be talking with uh, Miliaku. Uh, and, and she's going to correct me on that uh, in a moment, I'm sure, um, as, as, as well she should. But uh, Miliaku comes to us from Twice as Good in Cooperation, um, drawing on uh, blackness, queerness, transdisciplinary design um, to cultivate cooperation and move, help groups move through conflict. Um, had the uh, wonderful um, experience of, of sitting in on a workshop um, or session that uh, Miliaku um, was on a panel for at our 2020 Chicagoland Worker Cooperative Convening. Um, the panel was entitled Developing a Culture of Collective Ownership and Accountability. Uh, so we had some worker owners in there um, moving through some processes and practices that uh, Miliaku uses with other groups and other spaces um, to, to help work through the, the things that cause us to, to to separate from one another, the things that tear apart our social fabric in organizations and in spaces. And beyond that, you know, we'll just be talking about what uh, brings Miliaku to this work. Um, so I, I look forward to uh, hearing what Miliaku has to say about these things. And, you know, I hope that you derive uh, value and benefit from this conversation. 
Uh, so please make sure that you check into the comment section uh, with, the, with comments, with questions. Uh, we will be monitoring those throughout the dialogue and uh, trying to get to some of those if you have questions about that. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and open up the interview window. Uh, welcome to the conversation. Hi. Hello. Uh, thank you. That was such a great introduction. And yes, what was it? What was it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, no problem. No problem. Ibo is a tricky language. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, um, why don't you help uh, introduce people to your story? Um, you know, we we we'll talk later about what Twice as Good is. Um, you know, as an entity. Um, but tell us, you know, what brings you up to the work that you're doing now? You know, in in as as short or as broad a, a, a way as you would like to offer to us in terms of that? Um, I think I've always sort of um, had this uh, inclination toward uh, betterment. And that was like betterment of the self and that also scaled to betterment of everything around me, you know? Um, and I, I kind of hesitate to use the word better because it can be so empty. Um, but it's hard to be able to communicate, <laughs> um, I guess, freer. I think I've always had an inclination towards whatever I understood to be the righteous thing um, or the morally incorrupt thing to do. And um, for a long time, I thought that was fitting into the status quo economy as best as I could. I thought that was about shaping myself um, to fit into whiteness. So I felt behind and I did all of these different things to sort of catch up to this uh, white world, white ways of being, white educational systems and institutions, um, because I thought that's what it mean, meant to be freer. Um, I accidentally slipped into Oberlin. <laughs> um, uh, who the institution is still a, a very much an institution, but the special thing about Oberlin is the students. And I was quickly challenged. I think one of my best friends, uh, she, we're, we're like close friends to this day um, uh, of many years. She called me a white supremacist freshman, college, freshman year of college. And I was like, so taken aback. I was like, how can I be a white supremacist? I'm from the motherland. Like I'm, I'm the OG, I'm OG. <laughs> um, and um, over time, what I came to realize was that I was doing what most people do when they want to be successful within the context of the status quo economy. They distance themselves from blackness, not just black people, not just black culture, uh, not just black neighborhoods ways of talking, ways of conversing. I would say that black 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 people are, are naturally um, good at conflict, for example, uh, and confrontation and, and speaking honestly and plainly. Ways of um, making relationships, so on and so forth. Um, just found myself dis distancing myself from a lot of that um, in order to be successful, to realize a, a greater sense of freedom. Um, and over the four years I was in college, I became deeply politicized. Um, I was like, you know, on my way to being like Condoleezza Rice, and then I became like a hippy dippy queer, you know, like, <laughs> that like, you know, experimented with mushrooms and, and like, you know, and it's like, oh, what's this polyamory thing? And I think, um, that change just reoriented my entire life. I did still end up going into corporate America, but then there was just, I just kept learning and, do, and, and taking in so much information and going to all of these programs. And there was something in me that was like the impact space, the business space, that will not free us. Um, and then I sort of found like the solidarity economy and started, uh, I quit, I left corporate America and started working for all of these grassroots organizations and I quickly began to see the ways in which grassroots organizations would be mirroring corporate America. Um, and I became really, really, I guess like discouraged in a lot of ways. And then, then came in Twice as Good Inc. 
which is a project, I say, not an organization, where we are the project, where the, the, the point of the project is literally to live out the reality as best as we can right now here today. And so we have a free school where we do uh, free, free education, skill-based learning, and we have a housing network. And then we have a core group where we call like the family. Uh, where we do like different events, so we'll do like a pop up free store. We'll do um, we'll do like a like a like a sort of like community parties, <laughs> like kind of like block parties. Um, we'll do like little talks and workshops and webinars, so on and so forth. But yeah, I hope that was like a good synopsis. It's the day after Christmas. I'm a <laughs> no, it was, it was it was a great synopsis. You know, again, you know this this segment is definitely about yeah your story and sort of your telling. So. You know, yes. Um, however, however you you uh, feel the story most complete, you hold that. Um, and so, you've talked you talked a moment ago about sort of your um, arrival at Oberlin and then your distancing from blackness. Um, what's uh, what are the sort of relationships that you felt you know were between that and the first generation aspect you know um, that that you've um, noted in, in sort of your intro to me. Um, how how did you kind of you know how how did you kind of you know locate um, the, the the relationship between those two identities? The relationship between being first generation American and trying to distance myself from blackness. Yes. Yeah, um, it's funny you ask. My mom actually is Black American. Um, I don't know if I should, we'll get in trouble for talking about this, <laughs> but but I'm about the Harrison family business. <laughs> um, I hope she doesn't find this. Um, but um, we sort of would try and distance ourselves from from blackness in a lot of ways in, in our household, you know, um, and just in whose family and whose culture we sort of oriented ourselves more toward. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of I think to your point that I think you're also alluding to that I think is a real point. A lot of Africans do come here and they're like, I'm not black, which is real, right? Blackness is a construct that exists through um, the oppressive presence of whiteness. And when you're in a country with no white people, um, where people have literally never seen a white person, you know, maybe outside of the TV, <laughs> you know, and they only identify with their, you know, ethnicity. And then you come to a completely different cultural context and all of a sudden you're being called this thing that you're not really even, you don't have a lot of a framework to understand. Um, and your taught is lesser than, right? You're automatically gonna reject it. But Amador Diallo was shot with like 11, 13 times in New York, a Senegalese man by NYPD. And I think, um, I think, um, Actually, a professor in college said this, Professor Charles Peterson, um, Black Americans and Africans view each other through the lens of the oppressor. And so there's that disconnect there that kind of like feeds that separation and definitely inspires a sort of like movement away um, from things that are associated with Blackness, yes. If I'm being honest, you know, it's not an easy thing to be honest about. <laughs> It, it is not, you know, but hopefully, you know, these are these are transparent discussions, um, and you know, and you 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 tell me at some point, you know, are these if if that level of transparency is what is required to unify. But before we get to that, um, I, I wanted to ask, you know, what is the character? Um, so you you you'd mentioned also growing up in Detroit, you know, what's the character of Detroit playing in terms of? Um, does it factor into your radicalization later, or is it just? <laughs> <laughs> does does abs absolutely 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 you know I think um you know Detroit builds a certain kind of person okay my mom was like you have to know how to advocate for yourself in a certain way and be in a certain way and I think the the roles that we need right now the roles that are emergent um right now in the on the radical lefts are fighters we need people who and i don't say fighters like oh no 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 no. i mean sure but when i say fighter i mean people who you might call stubborn but i would call rooted 
right? You have a relationship to a set of what some might call principles, I call cherishables. Things that you cherish, things that you hold dear, things that are just a part of, they're a part of who you are as much as the microbiome in your gut. Like they, they are the things that you cherish. And um, you have to have that sort of like groundedness and deep rootedness to be able to really fight for something. You ever get so angry, your, your stomach comes up through your eyes, you know, like you have to really believe in something that deeply to want to fight for it. And I think um, coming from a place where um, you had to mean what you say and say what you mean because people would hold you to it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> definitely help build a fighter in me for sure. I think also watching um, how the 2007 housing crisis just decimated Detroit, just just decimated Detroit. Just seeing that stark difference um, definitely planted some seeds in me that were 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 highly radicalizing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I've just finished, um, as a part of the Cooperation for Liberation, we were reading Freedom Farmers, Dr. Monica White. Um, and, you know, I am getting a sense that Detroit, you know, feels like um, one of those up south territories, you know, something that we uh, we sometimes say about, you know, um, St. Louis, you know, St. Louis, just, mm -hmm. St. Louis got a little bit more up south in it than certainly Chicago. But, you know, Detroit and St. Louis is these up south territories. Um, but yeah, you know, D uh, Dr. Monica White is, you know, using Detroit as this uh, background or backdrop for this framework, collective agency and community resilience um, built, on, built on economic autonomy, prefigurative politics, commons as practice, uh, praxis. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, I am, I am, um, I've been, you know, eyeballing and, and just kind of in, engaging with Detroit for a long time, just being in, in the Midwest, but, you know, I, I'm always interested in how it factors and how people understand um, cooperation or understand some of these other politics that you know are at work right now um, so I, I want to want to revisit then um, Oberlin you know um, at Oberlin you become involved in um, Oberlin the Oberlin cooperatives or the Oberlin cooperative yeah yeah I was so deeply into the Oberlin cooperative student association very deeply I was really into it being this thing that was student run. And that was one thing about Oberlin I didn't appreciate until I was there is how experimental and like free flowing and open thinking and um, again, experimental the student body was. I think while I was there, I was like, oh, I'm like, again, like, okay, this is what we're doing right now. But in retrospect, um, just being around people who are constantly pushing the picture frame open, the Overton, the, you know, at the edges of the Overton window, it really shaped how I thought about what was possible. You know, I always had this very clear idea of like hierarchies. Like I grew up Igbo, very ageist society. I had a very clear idea about like order and like structure and like hierarchy and like the purposes that that served. And it was just interesting to go to Oberlin and then be a part of a cooperative uh, business that um, was it run by the school? It was it run by faculty? It was run by students making decisions. And we took ourselves so seriously. You bet your bottom dollar. We took ourselves so seriously. But, but we're like, we're a multi-million dollar business. Like, what? <laughs> but I think, um, you know, outside of feeling ourselves, we were doing a lot of like pivotal work. You know, I, I learned what it meant to like, have to really show up for something. I learned what it meant to really have to be accountable to a group of people. I learned and I got to be in the practice of making collective decisions with people to which I had no blood or familial, you know, relation to, you know, and like, okay, like, all right, so like, how are we gonna do this? You know, how are we gonna strategize and like order food so that we all get refund checks at the end of the semester? Like, you know, just really, <laughs> just really, uh, incredibly formative about what I thought could be possible outside of family formations. And even being Ni Nigerian, being Igbo, my idea of family was already not based on the nuclear family. Like we were raised by so many people. I still don't know who I'm really blood related to, but you know, you have, you know, like, I mean, I know, I know some, but like, you know, the lines of family are a little blurred, you know, like 
my parents, you know, taught some of my cousins how to drive, you know, um, when my parents would go to Nigeria, we would stay with, you know, whomever for a long periods of time. We had a community of people who were actually a community. I think that word gets overused. We were actually interdependent with each other. And through that interdependence with, okay, Miliaku has scoliosis, so we don't really know what to do, but we know that Dr. So and so in our community is an orthopedic surgeon, so we're gonna go to him because we're gonna we and we can trust him, right? It's this this level of trust that we can have because we know that he's one of us. You know, it sort of goes back to your point of unity, um, uh, about unity being on not not fabricated and not made up. It was unity really based on a shared set of principles and ideals, and that's also something I learned. At Oberlin, it's very difficult to make decisions with people that, and one of the struggles with Asuka, it's very difficult to make decisions with people when you don't have, you know, shared ideals or shared uh, shared political or uh, practical foundation for, for being. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I went on a little bit of a tangent there, but. No, no, tangents are welcome. Tangents are welcome. Um, because, I mean, you know, in the, in the, the lesson is in the tangent, so I, 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 I I love um, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, um, so you 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 work with the Oberlin Student Cooperative Association. Um, how does that evolve into? Well, one, um, why don't you describe what you feel like your work and research is um, in this current moment? You know, um, how how is that constituted? And then, you know, maybe relate that back to how you came to that work from the Oberlin uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, uh, that's such a good question. So currently right now I'm in another white institution because I am addicted to school um, and student loans. <laughs> uh, uh, my current thesis is that relationships are the playgrounds for the revolution. So how do we use relationality and the conflict that comes from the friction of being in close proximity to each other to start a fire to burn all this other shit down. <laughs> and that when it comes down, all we have left is this interdependence on each other, which is, which is, which I think is like interdependence is is God, you know, that is truth. Um that is the world, that is the earth, that is the universe. Um, um I believe that design is this really awesome thing because it allows us to create space where there is none right and like uh what we make space for is what will be that's true again for the microbiome in your gut and when you want to introduce a new bacteria there has to be a niche for the new bacteria to be able to proliferate right mm -hmm. that for change on that level within ourselves and i think that's true it's also true on a on a on a on a level between you and me that's true <laughs> on a level between us and we that's true, uh, you know, on a level that, that scales. And, and I, that's where sort of, um, you know, you were talking about prefiguration, anarchists sort of have this um, tendency to create like little uh, micro, uh, I, I, I wouldn't call them communities, but I'll say micro projects. I don't know, white, white anarchists don't, I wouldn't say whiteness and relationality go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, but um, these uh, little communities that are interconnected between each other. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I'm, I am wanting to explore and design the, uh, the revolutionary possibilities within those formations mm -hmm. uh, outside of the state. So what does it look like to meet each other's needs outside of the state and the market? And how can relationships as the playground for revolution help us realize that? Um, I think that's a good summary. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a conflict, as you mentioned, is like incredibly important to that, working through conflict to build deeper understanding, always being truthful with each other. I think that a little bit of that was also in your opening. Um, and the transparency, being transparent with each other. We can't actually resolve conflict if we're not being transparent with each other. Conflict lives in what is not said. Um, you talked about building uh, an economy based on care. You know, care, care is omnipresent. Um, it's what is done to, and I think um, conflict is what we do with, you know? Um, so I think conflict is also a form of care that would be integral in sort of integrating these sort of different communities who have these different foundational beliefs that hopefully are not oppressive to each other. Oppression and freedom cannot coexist. They cannot uh, build unity. 
Um, yeah, I think I could go on and 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 on about my about my thoughts <laughs> about my research um, and my work and 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 how design I think is so is 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 the how for me. Um, I guess how I got there, starting with Oscar. Um, trying to, that's a really good question, actually. Trying to think about what I saw there. I think I saw a lot of tools for people working through conflict in Oscar. We had a lot of like um, discussion tools um, to have conversations. So like, you know, this is upvote. This is like I'm iffy on it, and, we, and there was a lot of care in it. Like, if somebody's iffy, we can't just go ahead with it. We have to stop and pause and like have more conversation. And I was like, oh, that's such a novel idea. Like, someone's iffy, and instead of just being like majority rules, too bad. It's like, no, we have to actually hear what this person has to say and try to integrate it into the problem we're trying to solve. Ooh, problem solving. Ooh, this is a design opportunity. This is fun. And that probably was my first run in with witnessing the power of just designing something and like understanding how much agency agency we all have to design experiences and systems and structures with each other. Um, yeah, and um, I think I maybe fell off a little bit when I left Oberlin um, and having an experience that rich um maybe through co-living but never as deep as as i think was in college um but i think really the uprisings in covid really solidified this idea that relationships are the playground for revolution for me because i think what we saw first of all we saw the hood turn out <laughs> detroit stand up <laughs> we saw <laughs> we saw we saw, I think people are calling it a black avant-garde, whatever. I think, I don't really know what that means, but I saw people who have been living with each other, working with each other on the same block for decades, be like, oh, no, nah, enough is enough. And we're going to show up and out for, for hours, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and they had that feeling of ownership, though I know that is also a dirty word. <laughs> You know, I, I want to say care. They had a feeling of care, actually. It wasn't about feeling like that is my so-and-so. Maybe that was a language that materialized it. But I don't think the concept that was present was ownership. I think the concept that was present was care. And look what happened. And I think it's so interesting. I, I'm going off on another tangent. Here's where, where the lesson is. I think it's so interesting what emerges revolutionary, revolutionarily when we move from this concept of this is mine and I must own it and protect it as mine versus this is something that I care deeply about and feel connected to. And sort of that, that uh, fighter passion that I was talking about earlier, how we just saw that naturally emerge um, and people were able to trust each other. And so they were able to take different risks that they might not have otherwise taken. Uh, people wanted to build things and create futures with each other. Uh, people began to, I literally heard, I literally heard, I don't know if I can say this, but I literally heard in the street, you know, you know, I don't care if you're gay. I don't care if you're straight. I don't care what you are. I heard a black man saying this, you know, like, everybody showed up for each other tonight. As far as I'm concerned, we, we, we got us. We got us. And I like, I'm even now thinking about it. It's like, <laughs> it's kind of tearful to see um, the power of connectivity, you know, underlined by care play out that way. Where it isn't really about trying to control each other, but it really is just about wanting to fight, fight for the well being of each other just from here. Um, and then we also saw what happened when people did try to play a role of ownership of like, oh, I'm a community organizer. I've been doing this, da, da, da. you know, Maroon Schultz, um, uh, Russell Maroon Schultz, Free Maroon, um, the political prisoner in Philadelphia with Mumia. Like he talks a lot about like black fighting formations and how um, uh, uh, like SNCC and NAACP would, um, would sort of like cooperate with the state and like try and trying to emerge as a leader of the movement. And the minute they did, you know, uh, Black Liberation Army, Black Panthers, it gave the state, you know, sort of like a cover to go and um, 
murder and uh, incarcerate um, more revolutionary people. And I think, yeah, we see how in a weird way, like ownership completely squashed the emergent beauty of um, camaraderie, you know, during this movement. And I think that inspired a lot of Maybe, I, maybe there are things along the way and just the ways that relationships have played out in my life and have changed me, like from the Condoleezza Rice that I was, you know, on the way down to being toward, towards the hippie duty, you know, gay ass radical <laughs> um, that I am um, or, or, you know, whatever that I, I think of myself as. And, um, you know, and people just engaging in conflict with me on that level and like what that made me show up for and what that made me give a fuck about. I think the last thing I'm gonna say is like, people oh, you know, you're fighting for a cause that isn't yours. And like, you know, you're an ally. It's like, I don't know. It's like, you're not thinking about this, right? You're coming at this from ownership. You're not coming at this from care, you know? Um, yeah. Stream of consciousness, day after Christmas. Re received, you received. No, um, you know, I, I want to um, dig in, you know, just to one term here that, you know, um, came up on a previous segment, but, you know, it's coming up here now with your work. Um, for you, what is design? How would you frame that concept of design and, and you know, maybe why it's important for this work of, you know, building um, cooperation? Wow. Oh. I'm trying to think. In my application to school, I opened with something like very flowery. Um, what did I say? Research is the art of discovery. I think I said, research, like a question is a never ending discovery. Design is the answer or like design is the how or something. What did I say? I don't remember, but. I guess if I'm to put it simply, design is about, oh my God, God, I mean, design is omnipresent, just like care is, like, you know, it's like everything is design, you know, and I'm not just talking about humans, like the trees are master designers, you know, like master designers. Mycorrhizal networks are master designers of, of how to allocate resources in a, in a forest. You know, um, everything's designing all the time. And I think it's just about design, it's just about making. It's about materializing. It's about creating experiences um, for people, things that people feel, things that people in interact with with their senses, whether they know it or not. And I don't think that always means that not, the design is benevolent. I think that that is a big, big trap that people fall into. I think um, our, you know, design, design is a result of desire. You know, you have Amakar, Amakar Cabral, um, you know, African freedom fighter. And he talks about how uh, capitalism was the design of Europeans' desires and their response to scarcity. I think I think just, I think design really is everything, <laughs> everything. Um, and then, like I said earlier, it's about creating space where there doesn't seem to be any, you know, um, especially like speculative design, which I, um, there's a term I prefer called speculative disruption that I also coined, but like also like <laughs> I prefer it um, where it's not predictive, you know, it's not about, you know, designing because of the way things are going, you know, we don't need to face ecological disaster. We can fix, we can, we can design disruptively against that. <laughs> um, yeah. Is the, I don't know if that answers your question or it is too. No, no. I mean, that's, that's, that, no, that's, that's absolutely. I mean, again, you know, the, the lesson is in the tangent and in the expansive conversation. I, I mean, the question sort of comes to me because I, I do, you know, a lot of facilitation myself. So I do a lot of spatial design. Um, and I was talking to, um, you know, someone whom I consider an elder, um, Baba Fred of uh, Black Oak Center Healthy Food Hub. Um, and we were talking about this space that we're in, in COVID, where everyone has to meet virtually. And I was just sharing, hey, you know, I'm doing a lot of design work on virtual spaces so that they can feel more human. 
and you know and um he 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 always responds with the query right so he's like yeah but you know there was a designer that preceded you designing that space so like you know did are you actually designing that space or did someone force you to design in that container and yeah you know i mean zoom and facebook and google and you know and you know, whomever, you know, all of these virtual platforms have forced us to design in these non-human spaces. And they probably have some outcomes that they want from that design. And we have to be attentive to that, to your point. It's not always benevolent. And we are always designing um, as people who are focused on the human beings in the space. We are always designing against people who are dehumanizing us. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in that design question. Yeah, there's a quote by Tony K. Bambara, the role of the artist is to make revolution irresistible. And I love that quote because um, I think, you know, you could replace that word with the word artist with designer, you know? And in that way, we're all designers. We are able to design experiences that make the revolution irresistible. And to your point about, what containers we have to design in. Yeah, we kind of have to get a little bit meta about like, like, yeah, like what, what, am, what is actually influencing the parameters of what I think is possible, right? If the design is a materialization of possibility, what am I actually allowing to be the limits, you know? And I think that's where the environment that you're in is so important, where the work about shifting from one economy to the next, and that's sort of what TAG's work is trying to do, is about creating different environments. And how do we create different containers? We create different relationships. And I think um, Nora Basin has a great podcast. I think the title is called like The Spaces in Between, where she talks about this. It's like, this is where change happens. Like, if I'm no longer, you know, I'm only Black because there are white people, right? So like, what does that happen when, what, what do I become when there are no white people? You know what? You know what? What does identity look like? How is how is that shaped? How does that then shape the environment? How does the environment shape me? You know, so on and so forth. Meta, meta, meta. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um. And and you know, I'll, I'll I'll punctuate maybe this space with um your a statement from you, a quote from you. I believe we make revolution make a revolution by building home in each other. Um. Did you did you want to elaborate on that, or you just want to want people to sit and and and, and float with that? Because you said you're still wrestling with it yourself. Yeah, um, there's a there that has a that has a whole quote to it. Let me find that. I put it in a zine I made. <laughs> oh, a tech shiftery for the budding maroon. I had to do this for a school project, and I was just like, I need a quote. Ah. Relationships are the playground for revolution. To make home as revolution is to build home within each other and everything around us. Yeah. I think um, I have, I really feel an affinity towards physical spaces. I mean, I, I can, I do, I'm human, like I do. Um, but that home feeling that people describe, I don't actually feel it necessarily in a space. I feel it in people. I feel like, oh, you are where I belong. That makes sense. Um, or you are whom I belong to. Um, and when we make that home in the other person, again, there's this care that must emerge. You must care for your home. And I think um, in a world that is constantly inciting competition, domination, oppression, whatever, um, to treat someone as if they're your own home would be a revolutionary emergence, I believe. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I want to um, to name, you know, something that you you also shared in sort of your in, your intro um, in, in terms of struggling with neurodivergence. Um, I'm interested in that in that just because um, one of the things that we have been discussing within Co-op for Lib on the facilitator circle is really just about you know um, what access means and sort of you know how 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 we're engaging in terms of sort of understanding what what people's needs are. So. Um, I'm interested in both, you know, your struggle with that, but also how that informs how what you bring to the work and how you design spaces. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Yeah, so um, yeah, I am a weirdo. <laughs> 
uh, self-described, um, and I'm okay with people calling me that. I um, I think probably the reason I see design as making space for, and even just as a black woman in a white man's world, like uh, Lucille Clifton, Clifton has a beautiful poem about this. I've had to make myself so many times over, you know. Um, I've had to design and design again and design anew. Um, neurodivergence. Yeah, I have a lot to say. Uh, I think I think the neurodivergence honestly makes me harder to understand because we're both looking at the same thing, but I'm not seeing what everyone else is. You know, um, I'm just not. <laughs> uh, sometimes words look different. Like sometimes they look like shapes. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. Um, sometimes I'm not catching things. Sometimes I'm, we hear the same exact sentence, but I can, got a completely different message. It's just the stimuli that I receive is just different from what we experience as the norm. Um, and that also creates a lot of conflict, right? And so like, I mean, I love Audre Lorde's piece on, you know, the master's tools is like, you know, descending into difference to reemerge with something else, with something new, something forged together. And I think that's sort of my role in a lot of spaces with this neurodivergence is like, I'm like, oh, but like this thing over here, out here, like we can make this thing out here, out here. And people are like, who is this crazy girl coming in here talking about this? Okay, sweetie. <laughs> And then four months later, everyone's like, oh. And I have a mentor, Noni Session, who is, um, she she's the executive director of EB Prec. And, um, you know, and she sort of takes my neurodivergence and, to make me feel good about it. She talks about it as like uh, the capability of a visionary. Um, and she's like, when you're a visionary, you can just see things that people can't. And you have to like, be gracious to give people time to catch up. So that's something that I've been struggling with, a lot of frustration, you know, feeling so not understood um, just because of what way my brain works and where my headspace is and, and how that can create difficulty in communicating. And then therefore that can create difficulty in being with people. Um, and yeah, just, yeah. I don't know. Does that answer the question at all? I mean, you can ask it again. Ask it. You can ask it again. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it was really just about, um, yeah, your your conception of this this struggle with neurodivergence, and then also how both that has, yeah, you you noted how it how it challenges how you engage and integrate into spaces, and then it also and also possibly how you how it helps you to bring a different approach to the work that ensure, assures that other folks know there are other people like me, you know, um, there, there are other, like, there are other folks who are, who are, you know, um, and I, I consider myself to have just, like, I have multiple tangents happening to myself at any given conversation. <laughs> to, like, you know, I'm focused on one conversation and I'm like, oh, but that was a really good squirrel, you know, I mean. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I definitely just want other people to hear that, like, you know, yeah, I mean, and, and, and to the to today's conversation, this might be a factor in, in what disrupts unity. Like, if you don't make sure that you open up the way for, you know, other folks to engage with the space, then, you know, they will leave. I have left. <laughs> you know? Damn, damn, same. And, 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 and it's also a reminder to myself in the face of, uh, a difference in the, in that way, in a neuro, in a way of neurodivergence of like, yeah, how do we create? It's like we will have this difference here if we make space for it. So yeah, how do we then design space to accommodate uh, differences in how people process the world? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to shift to this notion, these these guiding principles around uh, twice as good, which are transformative relationship with capitalism, restorative relationship with the earth, and healing relationships with each other. So, um, so considering those guiding principles, what is the the economic system or the sort of the type of economy you envision yourself designing towards or working towards um, in that context? 
Yeah, there's been something, I just taught a class in the free school on something called queer economics, um, like queering economies, abolishing patterns of reform and, and, and um, crafting a way out. And it's been, um, that's like the best name that I can give it. <laughs> I think um, abolition, abolition would be another way to think about it, like radically black queer feminist abolition. <laughs> um, there's this quote from uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore about abolition that I really love. There's one, uh, there's one thing that you need to change in abolition and that's everything. And I think that is our, approach to re-envisioning an economy. I think one way that we say it is like, um, we have a couple of things, like for example, like like abundance, this idea that we can all be giving and receiving and like here, I'm gonna go to the list, like all be giving and receiving and then like feeling the weight of neither um, instead of scarcity. And the abundance doesn't mean endlessness, it just doesn't mean scarcity, <laughs> you know, like there's enough for everybody. Um, if everybody shows up in that way, you know, um, the commons over the property. So too did the empire disrupt the commons, the commons will disrupt the empire. Um, and I'm defining commons as uh, an absence of ownership over goods and resources that are used to meet human uh, needs or desires, even leisure. So it doesn't have to just be biological needs. It's a, you can, we already have common spaces. I'm, I'm looking across the street where at the park where people are pay, playing tennis with each other. That's a common space. Nobody feels like they own that tennis court, but they use it to um, collectively enjoy themselves in, you know, in their neighborhood and minding their black owned business. But, <laughs> <laughs> they're like ass business, but you know, just minding their, you know, playing tennis, you know, it's just, um, it doesn't have to be about, you need to get off of this because it's mine or you can't use this because it's mine. And everybody gets to enjoy it. Um, the other thing is like, uh, the uh, I would say another tenet of the economy is like transform it, transformation over reformation. It's like, again, it's like this queer economy. It's just like, how do we not keep building the same version of capitalism. I think there was, what was the quote um, here? I have it, I have it up here. Uh, relying on the devil we know to ignore un our uncertainty about the future is the niche space, niche space with conditions fomenting reform. We are aiming to defeat inequity by sourcing societal designs from the reservoir of its symptoms and synonyms, different forms of capitalism. So what does it look like to every chance we get design a system that is, doesn't, doesn't mirror the processes of capitalism. I think something like we like to do often is like replace, replace, replace. Why we need to replace is like, that's why I also think of like uh, a removal as a, as a design practice. Like what does it mean to just take, take this part out and see what it, and see what emerges? What does it mean to um, not just go and be on a co-living project and a lot of co-living projects fail for this reason, but but maybe I go and be on a co-living project, not because I know it's the best way to live, but because I've done the emotional and the psycho-emotional work to uproot um, toxic forms and transactional forms of relationality in my body. Um, it's a the removal that allows for the emergence of this new thing. It's not just running to this new thing. So transformation over reformation um, and then generativity over productivity. What does it mean to like, make things not for the purpose of generating profit but literally for the purpose of just having abundance having enough abundance enough same difference um yeah i would say those are sort of like the guiding principles and that could look like you know and then transformative relationship with capitalism like people still have to pay our rent right now um that's the current reality right now so maybe yes this person has more money this month, they shoot it to the other person to help them, you know, cover their expenses for that month. Maybe it looks like, um, or it does look like, you know, having meals quite often with each other and showing up when each other 
Uh, is it having a busy week with food to help out? It could look like um, running errands for the other person. It could look like liberating food together from different grocery stores. It can, that's, that's a mutual aid network. You know, it doesn't have to be about, we're doing this for the poor people over here. It's like, no, we, we are the project. We're doing this for ourselves, but not for ourselves, but for ourselves, you know what I mean? Um, not like for this person we deem to need our help. Um, yeah, I don't know if that those are like, concrete examples, but I think we always look for these like sort of, or like sexy examples. I think we always look for these like super big, like, oh, look at this, like transforming the world. But like the transformation is in the mundane. Like the mundane is the biggest design opportunity. What uh, the park bench, right? The park bench, like designers have completely changed the course of houselessness in a city by just putting an armrest on park benches so that houseless folks can't sleep on them. It's in the mundane that you have these big abrupt transformations. And I feel like we don't treat that space uh, cool enough. And so when I think about economic transformation, I'm not thinking about bringing General Electric to its knees. I'm thinking about uh, being accountable to the harm that I caused when I called this girl a bitch last week. You know, like, I'm like, you know, I'm thinking about like, those are the those are sort of the economic opportunities, and that's sort of what queer queering economics is thinking about. Hmm. Yes, um, yeah, the the definitely the mundane. You know, one of the things I've shared with a few urban planning friends is just you know one of the most interesting, um, sort of mo one of the most profound realizations I had around both design and urban planning was this notion of the mundane, which is that. I was driving by this particular corner intersection here in Chicago, 79th and Cottage Grove. And at this corner of 79th and Cottage Grove, um, the bus stop, you know, the bus stop shelter, which normally had a bench there, somehow the bench had been removed. And then just for a year, they never replaced the bench. You know, now in, in their notion, it's a loitering area, right? It's an area where people congregate because like, I mean, they're outside, like there's not a whole lot else to go congregate around. So we're just gonna sit on this bus stop bench. So, and, and then that's when I began to like, you know, be observant of the fact that, you know, I mean, all throughout the black community, just there's no benching, there's no, there's no benches, there's no seating, there's nothing to keep people outside because you don't want people out, you know, like go away. Yeah, yeah. you know, so I mean, it's it's um, definitely that mundane is, is just, is critical, but it's also to your point, like, you know, I mean, I mean the whole Jane Jacobs eyes on the street, like it's critical to like people people being outside and being in, in place helps to cement relationships. And when you go inside, those don't happen. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because it's like, yeah, they're doing everything in their power to prevent congregations of black people in black neighborhoods. And that is, that's what I'm saying. If the relationship weren't so fucking potent, they wouldn't be so intent on destroying that space, I think. Gathering, black people gathering. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to give space. Um, I, this this broadcast talks a lot about the solidarity economy and talks a lot about those particular principles. Um, you know, and I I consider myself um, a potent questioner and and critic of the solidarity economy in spaces that in this in the spaces that traditionally have held the solidarity economy. Right. So I want to open up the, the, the lane for, you know, whatever you might have to say about the limitations of the solidarity economy um, or, or, or aspects of it that you want to kind of make sure broadcast. All right, I'll try and be quick. Okay. <laughs> uh, 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 I, think, um, I think this is sort of where in my class we were questioning this fifth pattern of reform. And it's like, well, what are, the, what are, the, what are the, some of the major tenets of capitalism are exploitation and ownership. And um, a co-op can still be a business and maybe they're not exploiting in a sense um, the workers within the co-op, but again, everything is relational, even capitalism. So maybe I'm a bakery, but how do you get your flour? Where does that come from? Right. Who is growing it? How is it being grown? Is it, you know, is it being uh, mass? Uh, what are those called? Like, I'm new to the bio stuff, but like the mass far farming, you know, where they're just uh, making soil uh, non like non non nutrient rich, like nutrient poor, nitrogen poor. Is it um, 
is it is it being harvested by folks who are being paid well is are are the bananas that you use to make your banana bread coming from the banana slave plantations in costa rica you know and i think that's where it's like capitalism is global and i think we have to understand the impact as global and we have to know that co-ops have been around since the 1920s, 30s, you know, as a way for people to come together and fight capitalism. I mean, honestly, some scholars would argue that with uh, with the arrival of Europeans and capitalism in, in some African countries, co-ops um, had even started, you know, in the 18, 18, uh, 1880s, you know, as some might argue. So we've seen them lack a capacity to actually shift the, from through, through an abolitionist lens, shift the foundation of what's what's actually occurring in our economy, like the harm that's actually, now it makes it better, but better is not free, <laughs> you know? Better is not liberation. We don't want nicer capitalism. We don't want less exploitation. We want no exploitation. And I think um, sort of so the solidarity economy serves as this place of like comfort where it's still recognizable enough but does it really push past the limits of what commerce, capitalism, markets, and uh, state regulation are? And for me, the answer is no. Um, I don't think that means that we don't do co-ops, right? The Zapatistas, a lot of their work was funded through um, uh, like coffee co-ops that they had that they were selling to folks who wanted to support their cause. Um, but, I'm super inspired by projects I've seen happen without any money, you know, with just people coming together with what they just have or could steal or muster up or whatever to do direct action, you know? Like nobody was funding the demolition of the precinct in Minneapolis. <laughs> nobody was funding that, you know? Oh, I wanna cry tears of joy just from the imagery. But, um, <laughs> but you know, it's, I think, um, I, it's not to say that I don't think that they have their place or I, that I don't think that they're, that they shouldn't happen. I just think we have to be honest about what they are, you know? Um, is this actually revolutionary and transformative? Maybe for some people, not for me. Um, I, that's kind of where I am. I think it's, you know, I think has it has like some trillions of dollars. Co-ops contribute trillions of dollars to U.S. GDP. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to U.S. productivity. You know, it's like, you know, I think we are just using the solidarity economy as the goal when I think it could be a tool. Ooh, uh, <laughs> sorry. This I just thought of a book that I think um, Russell Maroon shows, again, uh, Maroon talks a lot about this. Um, and I think, um, yeah, now is the challenge to change our desires. Are our desires still to be important people who own businesses, <laughs> you know? And like the solidarity economy is a way to make that happen and feel better about it, or our desire is to be free from the market and the economy, and the market and the king, or the like the government. You know, like what is what is the desire? <laughs> you know, like what is the what? I, I'm trying not to like make people feel bad. It's not about that. So. No, I mean it's 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 about that that ideological that that struggle and you know that that political struggle and you know and, and engaging around those. So I I think it's an important it's an important and necessary um, element to kind of dig at um, because it's certainly easy to um, to highlight the best elements and the best aspects of the solidarity economy, the shining lights, you know, and say like those are really great examples um, without you know um, digging into what could go wrong you know and then and then you know designing and, and being aware that like we are trying to create spaces that that challenge that possibility um of exploitation of domination of of high of destructive hierarchy showing up you know because i'm i'm also very cautious about you know um like my sister dara noted one day like why are we always lambasting hierarchy 
something to kind of talk through, like something for us to kind of wrestle with, um, you know, but I, I, and I'm also reminded of like a conversation with Maria Haddon, you know, who's now an older woman uh, here in, uh, in Chicago, um, but previously was with um, the local participatory budgeting project, you know, and, and, and things like that. And so had done a lot of participatory budgeting design spaces. And, you know, one of the things she noted was that like, hey, look, I'm not saying that participatory budgeting is revolutionary. We're only giving people like, you know, one and a half million dollars in their ward to spend. But the process of people coming together to make decisions, to wrestle with decisions around what that budget is and how that budget is used is a revolutionary process. So, you know, finding those opportunities that are like, okay, here's a revolutionary process where the playground of relationships can, can, can be engaged. You know, um, I, I am with you. I, I, so I'm certainly with you on that, you know, um, as an aspect. Um, so, you know, I mean, I know my little clock has run out, but that clock is for me. It's not necessarily for the guest or the segment. But um, I, I'll, I'll ask this sort of final question of you, you know, um, just to the sort of principle of the day. Um, what would you say is a recipe for unity if you had to kind of cobble together something like that? <laughs> you know, perhaps from your facilitation experience or, or anything like that that you want to contribute. Woo! Okay. I should not chose the day after Christmas. I should really should not have chosen the day after Christmas. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, yeah, I did like four five four large finals and like, you know, some 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 work and then my brain is still somewhat fried. But um whew, okay. Um I want to actually pull in some of the things you said. I have I wrote them down. Um, let us not unite for you, not unity's sake. And I tell you that is a word. That is a word like Sunday. I think I think it's like coalition. Like right, we get a we get a buzzword. We get a buzzword, and we get more 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 interested in using the word <laughs> than it being the word. <laughs> you know. Um, we don't, what we do with words is we don't actually think about their meanings and we don't use, like, we don't use words as descriptors anymore, right? A coalition is in, is a coming together of an interdependent, uh, different interdependent groupings, right? Um, for a unified purpose or cause or whatever. And it's sort of like, you know, what we do instead is we say coalition, good. <laughs> so we just, you know, coalition good, standalone organization bad. <laughs> like, you know, we go, we go, abolition good. You know, not, you know, whatever bad, you know, socialism bad, whatever. We go, we don't actually say abolition, the creation of a new world through like, you know, destruction and creation as a singular force to realize a vision. We just say abolition good, <laughs> you know, like cop bad, you know, like we don't. We're not actually sitting sitting and wrestling with, with what things are. Um, as Donna Haraway says, staying with the trouble. Um, she also talks about this, about, you know, for example, essentialism in, in feminist theory just being bad rather than like understanding that when we're saying something's essentialist, we're just saying it's essentialist. And I think because we're just so stuck in the good, bad, filing of things and like these are these are the things that are good for the here and now and like these are the things that need to happen we lose we lose plurality and i think unity and plurality are so important because okay this is so long-winded okay so pablo escobar is a designer he's like famous in the design world for his 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 conception of something called pluriverses um which is like very similar to the zapatistas like mini worlds philosophy um and when i think about these like coexistent like a coalition like these coexistent groupings it's because they're different that that sort of made the unity possible in the sense that again going back to audrey lord's point it's like you're descending into the difference 
to build a deeper understanding of each other that allows for a sort of coexistence. Um, and so you can't be very uh, interested in what things seem like. You have to be aware of and interested in what they really materially are to actually build real unity. Not just unity good, we unify. No, <laughs> like unity is, unity like love is a, is work, like, you know? I think, um, yeah, unity is a result of the exploration and integration of difference. And I want to be really clear here because I think people have oppressive ideas and they think, oh, that's difference. Uh, that's oppression, right? Uh, if your idea or the way that you are cannot coexist with something else, and often that's how conflict becomes clear, when conflict becomes clear, cannot coexist with something else that the way that it is, it then becomes in in some ways um, oppressive in a way. Um, or not, not, not like in a way like racism is oppressive. For example, racism like capitalism cannot coexist with anything else just by the evidence of the fact that it has overtaken the earth and leaves no stone unconquered, you know, and in reconquers, right? You already reconquer. You're on settlers' land already, and now you're gentrifying entire cities. You know, I think. Okay, I'm tangenting, but yeah, just for, I guess let me just say yeah, unity is is the exploration and integration of non-harmful differences. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, you know, that has certainly been a whole word. We appreciate uh, all of that, you know, um, that has been shared there around unity. Are there things that you want people to know about twice as good or, you know, um, where they can find your work, where, where they can check you out, you know, just uh, feel free to t tell us about, you know, how we can... Uh, you know, know what, what Miliaku's up to, or, you know, or just kind of- Yeah, just, just follow me on Instagram, M-I-L-I-A-K-U. Uh, I'm gonna publish some writing soon at the um, pushing of one of my professors. So um, <laughs> with a lot of these ideas, like far more eloquently spelled out. Um, but yeah. So just M-I-L-I-A-K-U, everything I do, I post on my Instagram. Um, yeah, Twice Is Good Inc. You website, www.twiceisgoodinc.org. Instagram, Twice Is Good Inc. Um, we have a media project, Subject to Change. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, I mean, yeah. I'm more interested in people trying to design the emergence of meaningful coalition and relationship and unity, if you will, <laughs> than necessarily following us on Instagram. But yeah, if you wanna hear more of my thoughts, M-I-L-I-A-K-U. Okay, okay. And we have uh, posted those in the chat um, for folks to uh, link to um, both the Instagram for Miliaku as well as for Twice as Good Inc. Um, we'll go ahead and make sure we post also the, uh, the link to the uh, website for Twice as Good, um, you know, where you can engage more with these ideas, um, wrestle more with these design questions, um, and, you know, and get free. You know, let's, 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 all, let's all get liberated here, you know. Uh, 2021, get liberated, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope. I hope. That's yeah. tight. <laughs> oh. With that, um, I really appreciate you know your, your your willingness to engage in the conversation. You know, after after having you know the the twenty fifth, you know, settle in upon us, um, and you know, yeah. I, so I really appreciate you know the scholarship that you, you're engaging in, the work that you're engaging in, the research, um, and the shared experiences that you are passing on. Um, you know, and so thank you. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. Um... Yeah, I feel really honored to know you and um, for you to make space for me. So, yeah, just a deep, deep sense of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And, you know, and and so um, I'll bid you good day and, you know, we'll, we'll reconnect um, on, on another project, I'm sure. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great day. All right. You too, Lily.
<laughs> All right, folks, um, that was Miliaku Nubweze um, of Twice As Good, Inc. Um, so please make sure that you do check out the Instagram and the website. Um, uh, let me just, you know, make sure that I get that uh, web address into the comment section for you as well. Um, boom. There we are. So yes, uh, make sure you check out twiceasgoodinc.org. Um, you know, I, I appreciate those folks who have been able to kind of uh, drop into the segment today. Um, we have some really exciting conversations that are coming up, you know, throughout the week. Um, I did not get my favored, you know, um, guest for December 27th. So I don't know whether or not I'll jump on the broadcast tomorrow for Kuji Chagulia. We'll see. Um, but on uh, December 28th, Ujima, we've got Lasaya Wade of Brave Space Alliance, Collective Work and Responsibility. Um, they're happening within Brave Space. Um, we've got December 29th, Deidre Somerville of Isusu Chicago. Um, on the day of cooperative economics, on the namesake for this broadcast, we'll be talking about the Isusu um, uh, process. Uh, we've got December 30th, uh, Nia. Um, you know, where, where we'll purpose, where we'll be talking to Maida McNeil, Honey Pop Performance and Fifth City Project. And hopefully, not hopefully, but we will be recovering, you know, um, some of the audio and some of the content to that conversation that we, we missed earlier in the year. Um, December 31st, Kuumba, um and uh, January 1st, uh, Imani, there are no guests. So, you know, if you have been waiting to kind of tap into my shoulder for Ujima Hour, um, you know, you need to just kind of let me know before the week gets too late. Otherwise... I will take my days off on December 31st and January 1st um, and, you know, come back to you all with another broadcast uh, at the top of the year, um, January 11th, um, for our, you know, regular uh, monthly uh, second Monday, Movement Monday broadcast, we'll have Erica Allen of Urban Growers Collective and Green Era Sustainability Partners. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to that conversation with Erica. Um, already into the year, we'll have um, Caitlin Johnson of Black Roots Alliance on February 8th. Uh, Martin Cavarell um, of uh, Ujima Medics um, on March 8th. Uh, Latier Pipus is returning from Womanist Working Collective on April 12th. And, you know, um, up there in September, September 13th, we'll have uh, Hafida Akwe um, of People's Hub, you know, sharing some work, you know, that's been going on there. So we've got an exciting lineup so far this year. The, the roster is not full. That is about seven spaces that are open um, for additional folks to drop into the broadcast. And I do have my invitations out, so we will see. You know, you, hopefully I'll be able to publish my schedule at the top of the year. Um, but until then, folks, I appreciate you all dropping in. Look forward to seeing you all on the next broadcast um, up, coming up um, on the 28th. And until then, I bid you all peace.